from other sessions. So just hold tight with us for now. But while you're here, go ahead and set your mics to mute. Go ahead and rename yourself if you'd like to the name that you prefer and use the chat feature. We'll be following along there if you have questions as we go, both technical and related to the presentation. If you'd like to turn your camera on, we would love to see your faces and interact with you. And at the end of the session, we will have an evaluation and event MOBI that's at the bottom of your screen. So please fill that out at the end. We'll provide you another reminder at the end of this session. So about one more minute and we will get things started on the essential competencies for 21st century leadership. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Betsy and her colleagues to get us started on today's session. Thanks so much, Jess, and thank you, Eric, for being here to support us and our tech needs. On behalf of the session's presenters, I welcome you, and I sincerely thank you for being here with us today. We three presenters and our um, committee chair are members of the Society's Governing Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity, which is a formal structure for the advancement of DEI-related initiatives within the Society. My name is Ben Williams, and I'm an initiate of the Campbell University Circle, where I currently serve as Director of Academic Advising and my favorite part of my job, Circle Coordinator. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Covington, to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Sim Covington. I currently serve as the Chief Diversity Officer for Finger Lakes Community College in upstate New York. We are part of the SUNY system. SUNY stands for State University of New York, and we are the largest comprehensive university system in the United States. I am humble and very happy to be here. Josh? Thank you, sir. My name is uh, Dr. Josh Jordan. I am an instructor at Western Michigan University. I'm an initiate of the Purdue University Circle. Uh, in addition to serving on the Committee for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, I also serve in a volunteer capacity as uh, one of the board members of the West Michigan Veterans Coalition. And now I would like to hand it over to our Chief National Desert Diversity Officer, Dr. Monique Walker Pickett. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, I am Monique Walker Pickett, so I'm a 1994 initiate at the University of Miami Circle. And I was certainly honored when Omicron Delta Kappa invited me to serve as the inaugural National Diversity Officer. So let me tell you that as the National Diversity Officer, I'm chair of the Society's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity Committee. And that committee is a governing committee on the Board of Trustees. All right, so a little bit about the, uh, the history, I guess, of DEI and ODK. Um, as you know, ODK was founded in 1914, and it was founded as a men's only organization, which was the tradition at the time, right? Um, we did begin accepting women in 1974, and soon thereafter, um, we established our first circle at a historically black college or university. I'll abbreviate it as an HBCU. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, so we, we did that at Morris Brown College in 1976. Um, since then, ODK circles are currently located at six HBCU campuses, okay. and this spring we do have a new circle at Talladega College. That circle is supported by a grant from the Boulay Foundation, and that's a partnership uh, with ODK, which aims to expand Omicron Delta Kappa's presence at historically Black colleges and universities. Um, ODK issued its first uh, diversity statement more than a decade ago, and we expanded the EEO, pardon me, the Equal Opportunity Statement in about 2015 to make it clear that ODK's programs and activities, membership selection, and membership practices should be free from all bias. Uh, ODK also has a tradition on speaking of matters of national concern since April 1968, which is when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. We've also issued statements in 2017 after what happened in Charlottesville, and again in 2020 after the death of George Floyd um, and the others. 
Throughout the last year, ODK has held a number of heartfelt discussions on matters of diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And the last thing I'll do is tell you quickly about some additional recent efforts that um, we've done over the past year. So last June, our society issued a statement reaffirming our values and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Um, we followed up on this by sending a survey out to members asking how the society could be more diverse, um, inclusive, and an equitable organization. We established the Key Fund to provide scholarships and gifts of membership for students from historically marginalized and underrepresented populations. Two of the society's scholarships have been specifically designated for students from historically underrepresented and marginalized racial populations. And we also have two other scholarships that's been designated for students who identify as LGBTQIA+. We've also added website resources for members who want to learn more about how to lead in embracing social justice and social justice issues. Um, we do have awards which recognize individual community program and campus achievements in social justice in those areas. And then there's also information on the website that can tell you a little bit more about what I've just gone over pretty quickly about ODK's journey towards becoming a more inclusive organization throughout its 106 year history. Um, on a final note, I will tell you that uh, the society has not collected demographic information in the past, but this year we have embarked on a pilot project to collect demographic information from our members who are attending this national leadership conference. And so you may remember answering some of those questions that you haven't answered before um, when you did your conference registration. So certainly we're proud of the progress that we've made as an organization, um, definitely over the past few months, and we are absolutely dedicated to continuing this important work. Okay, so thank you for allowing me to make a few statements and I will turn it back over to Dr. Covington or Dr. Thornton, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very quickly, Betsy, I'll give it right back to you. I was initiated at the University of Albany, State University of New York in 2005. And for those of you who may not be familiar with HBCUs or historically black college, colleges and universities, I actually just put a great um, documentary in the chat. So I highly recommend it. Thanks. Very, thanks very much to you both. Um, I do want to follow up with a little bit of information to follow um, Dr. Walker Pickett's comments. She, she mentioned the collection of demographic information. And indeed, you had the opportunity to share demographic designations through your conference registration. One bit of information that I'll offer for you to chew on for today and perhaps beyond is that from our conference registration um, process, we were able to collect information. Our conference registrants reported association with 13 different racial identities. Individuals reporting non-white identities made up 25% of our nearly 300 conference participants. So here's why we're here today. <laughs> we, as the, as, as the, as members of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, um, recognize that there is far more to be learned on this topic than we could ever even scratch the surface in one hour. Perhaps even more than we could ever scratch the surface in the culmination of our, all of our conference sessions this week. Our goal today is to focus on content that frames the work yet to be done specifically to establish common language and understanding about matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to share with you opportunities to explore resources and commit to learning and leading on behalf of you, of yourself and your circles. One piece of terminology that we'll be using often throughout this presentation is DEI. To be clear, this is an acronym for the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the various parts of speech associated with each of these terms. There are three, there, these are three important terms with unique meanings and we'll specifically address each accordingly in this presentation. In the meantime, we wanted to let you know that we may use this acronym for these terms today, just as we do use them within society, within the society, uh, ODK, with regard to our society's commitment and initiative. Our first objective today is to establish that framework of diversity, equity, and inclusion as valuable competencies for, 20, for productive 21st century leadership. All right, so what do we mean by framework? In front of you, you see a conceptual model 
that we have adapted from the work of Shen, Chanda, Dinato, and Manga 2009, Managing Diversity Through Human Resource Management, an International Perspective and a Conceptual Framework. And what you can see is on the left-hand side of this conceptual framework that we've identified the importance of the issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, and I also include an A that means accessibility. Now there's three different levels within our organization. Now there's the strategic level, and that would be the national headquarters. Then there's the tactical level, and that's the circles themselves on the campus. And then there is the operational level, and that is your specific members. And there are different types of practices that you can enact at each level and different frames of how you view issues or opportunities within your capacity to drive DEI uh, issues and solutions. And then what comes along here, you see from the right is a cross-level alignment of efforts. And that just means that the strategic, tactical, and the individual member are all combined and aligned to what we want the outcome to be. And that is to meet the objectives such as Dr. Walker Pickett mentioned earlier. And the thing I'd like to leave you with with this framework is to continually strive for continuous improvement. And what I mean by that is a mindset where you look at everything that you do through the lens of how you can make it better but also how you can pass that knowledge on to the future uh, circle leadership within your circles. Uh, next slide, please. So what do I mean by framework? I talked about this. It's just a tool to visualize how we're uh, implementing and employing initiatives from the national all the way down to the circle individual level. And we hope it provides you a roadmap to, uh, to develop and employ the knowledge, skills, and ability to empower you to lead these efforts down at the circle and individual level. And also it's a roadmap that helps encourage idea generation from the bottom up and from the top down so that we can support all the circles, national and other groups to which uh, you belong to in their diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility efforts. And with that, I will pass this to Betsy. Uh, Betsy, you're on mute. There you go. I am on mute. See, it was bound to happen. <laughs> okay, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> we're going to engage in a group activity now. Um, if you will take a look at the screen, you will be randomly placed into a breakout group. And in that group, we'd like you to spend just a few minutes with the fellow, fellow members in your group um, working toward a common definition, uh, a definition that you all can come up with together around the word assigned to you. So group one diversity, group two equity, you'll just look at your group number um, and, and uh, plan to define these words. We're ready to enter the breakout groups now. All right, our breakout rooms have closed. So it looks like everyone is joining us back in the main room. Great, thank you. Yeah, we can get started. Thanks, Betsy. Great, thank you, Jess. Welcome back. I hope that you had an opportunity to meet a few new folks um, and have some good conversation, albeit brief. Um, I'd love to hear from everyone now through a poll, a set of polls. How did that go? Was, was defining a word easy or difficult in your group? Lots of easy. Okay, got some split decision going on now. Okay, good. So the majority of you are indicating, well, two thirds, um, that that was relatively easy, um, but some of you finding it difficult. Interesting, okay. How about the next poll? Let's talk about where, was there generally agreement within your group or disagreement? We have some agreeable folks. Okay, most of us have voted and it sounds like there was agreement within our groups for the most part. Okay, very good. Well, by no means was this activity about right or wrong necessarily, um, just an opportunity to give you a jumping off point. 
perhaps to emphasize the reason why that this work is so important and why we have work to do because perhaps this is a difficult um, task to think about these this word these words or this language. Um, I will share with you the definitions of each term and give you a second to scan those. And these definitions come from the society's website, from the diversity resources website specifically. And we'll refer more to that more to the diversity resources website a little bit later in the program. For those of you like me who prefer a visual representation of terminology, words aren't my thing, um, perhaps this will offer you an opportunity to think about specifically the language of diversity, equity, and inclusion through a visual format. Take a minute, take a look at this picture and reflect for just a moment on the climate of these concepts at your circle, your university, or perhaps within your community. And Dr. Covington. Thank you very much. So one of the things that I think is important for us to discuss when we're having conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion is to consider both the visible and invisible traits when it comes to this conversation. What you're seeing in this picture here is that above the uh, waterline, we have skin color, physical traits, behavior, body size, type, but we also have disability there, right? Disability is in red because you'll see it at the top as well as underneath the water because we also want to take the time to recognize both visible and invisible disabilities. In regards to the number of words that's underneath the water, I very, want, I very quickly want to share is that when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, matters of diversity is extremely complex, right? A lot of times when people think of diversity, they only think of about black and white or black versus white, and a lot of that is ingrained in the history of this country. But I wanted very quickly to share this picture to make sure that as you're having these conversations within your circles, you understand the complexity of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have what we would refer to as the big A. We also have a definition here for social identity, a person's sense of who they are based on group membership. In regards to the big A, they include age, ability, race, ethnicity, gender, or sex assigned at birth, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and religion. Next slide, please. Uh, when we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, it's also very important to have conversations based on the history of this country regarding privilege and oppression. So privilege, it's a special advantage, it's neither common nor universal. It's granted, not earned. It's a right or entitlement that's related to preferred status or rank. Um, privilege is exercised for the benefit of the recipient to the exclusion of others and it's a statin often outside of the awareness of the person who possess it. Now, very quickly, I wanna uh, acknowledge that a lot of times when people are having conversations around privilege, specifically people get triggered and they respond with things along the lines of, well, I didn't grow up rich, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth, et cetera. So here's my response to that. The way we describe privilege in the world of diversity, equity, inclusion is the following way. Privilege means there are certain things that some people have to think about that other people never have to think about. Once again, privilege is there are some things that some people have to think about that other people never have to think about. If I utilize myself right now as an example, privilege, I can see you. Privilege, I can hear you. Privilege, by default of my full name, which is Sim Jonathan Covington Jr., there's been plenty of studies in this country to show discrimination based on names when it comes to what's called the resume test. My name always passed the resume test, but if my name was considered more ethnic by default of the standards that are set in this country, I will lose out on tremendous job opportunities. Just some things to think about when it comes to privilege, right? Um, oppression, unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power. Uh, next slide, please. When having these conversations with others, I always have people fill in, um, I do an activity where we have people fill in their social identity. 
So as you see with this diagram here, this is something that you can do within your own circle, filling in whatever activity, um, excuse me, identity would be applicable to you based on your social identity category, and then going into whether or not you feel your social identity is one from a privilege or an oppressed background based on the history of this country. This is a rich opportunity for circles to delve into uh, the history of this country in general, as well as some of the modern day um, activism that we see going on across the country. Um, I did see something pop up that distracted me a little bit, so I wanna make sure that I address it. Um, gender is different than sex assigned at birth. Would somebody like to chime in a little bit about that? I got that from Cassandra. I know that I know that most people consider gender um, a social construct, but is it? We would love for audience participation. Cassandra, would you like to share? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yes, gender and sex assigned at birth are wildly different. <laughs> um, my sex assigned at birth was male. You can probably you can probably make an assumption based on my voice if I turn the camera off like that, and all you heard was my voice. Your automatic assumption is that you're talking to someone who is male. And that's a bias. So if I flip the camera, uh, lens back down on my camera, uh -huh. and you see who you're talking to, then you have another perception. That's gen what you're looking at is, I, I consider myself as a transgender woman, a post-op transgender woman. Uh -huh. That is my gender identity. Oh, my well, I'm sorry, male. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I cut you off, say that again. I said, my my gender identity is that I am a post-op transgender woman. That's my gen my gender identity. My sex assigned at birth was male because on my original birth certificate it said, "Hey, the doctor looked down there and he goes, that, that's a male." But in reality, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. <laughs> what well, that means. As you if if you look at the social identity categories that I have all the way to the left, as we sure. go down. Um, it becomes a little complex. And when I say complex, I'm not invalidating your contribution. So please do not interpret it that way. But as I'm continuing to have conversations, um, some people consider it sex or gender assigned at birth and they separate that from gender identity. But I'm very happy that you took the time during this presentation to talk about how you conceptualize it. Now, based on my understanding, the fact that um, my, um, I am a biological male and I identify as male, my gender identity would be considered cisgender for those of you who are not familiar. And um, once again, Cassandra, I would love for you to share because based on my understanding, if a person's biological makeup and their gender identity is not one of the same, they would be considered transgender. Am I representing your community in the correct way? Yes, you are. Thank okay, you. Thank, well, thank you very much for the contribution. I greatly appreciate it. But very quickly, I wanna show something as I went to the chat and Cassandra contributed to the discussion. When you're having conversations around diversity, equity, inclusion, it's important to navigate this space with a high level of humility, right? I didn't get defensive. I didn't say, hold on. Right? You wanna have conversation that validates the lived experience of others. So once again, we will have people from the circle fill in their identity and then consider whether or not they feel they come from a privilege or an oppressed background based on the history of this country. Next slide. When it comes to bias, there is implicit and ex in implicit and explicit bias. Implicit bias is individuals operating off a bias based on, um, on, on an unconscious level. But a lot of times when we're having implicit bias conversations, people only think about it in a negative context, but be advised that implicit bias can also kick in in a positive context called the halo effect. An example of that is a lot of people automatically assume because somebody is physically attractive that they're a good person and that's not true. Right. So we also see implicit bias by default of where someone may have gotten or received their academic training. So a lot of times on search committees, people may say, well, this person went to, went to blah, blah, blah university. They're going to be better for the job. Whereas when you should be navigating that process with a higher lens of objectivity. Last but not least, relevant to the halo effect, we also see that the more attractive the lawyer, that person may be prone to win more cases. So we definitely see implicit bias with the jury um, and physical attraction. Next slide, please. We have explicit bias. When it comes to explicit bias, the individual is fully aware of their belief, intention, and motivation to discriminate and deliver harm. Next slide, please. 
Um, sometimes within uh, the world of diversity, equity, inclusion, some organizations will intentionally bring in diversity to throw off from the systemic racism that's embedded in the organization. So that's referred to as co-optation, selective leadership practices in response to diversity that often benefits those in positions of power. So they'll bring in, for the street term, it would be referred to as tokens. They'll bring in diversity to, to deflect from the fact that there is significant racism going on. Let me provide you with an explicit example. Uh, a coach who may say, I prefer having black players on this team in order to win the national championship or the NCAA tournament, but of course he can't marry my daughter. Perfect example of bringing in diversity to deflect from the systemic racism that can also be embedded within the system. Next slide. The way that implicit bias plays itself out, it contributes to stereotypes and assumptions. Those stereotypes and assumptions impact our worldview that impacts our interactions. And one of the things that we see is that it gets sensationalized by the media. Next slide. The media outlets that we utilize or that saturates our time also impacts our worldview. So when it comes to having conversations around implicit bias or bias in general, it's important to remember that people get messages from three primary sources. One, your family of origin. Two, the media. And last but not least, your social circle. Those are going to impact your worldview, your positionality, and how you interact with others. Thank you, Dr. Covington. Next, we'll move into our second objective. Now that we've established this framework, we'd like to talk about how the society is addressing matters um, or, or for promote, addressing our promotion of um, our ideals, which include diversity and inclusion. Um, and in particular, we will be pointing to a number of resources that exist on the diversity resources website. As I mentioned, the society has made great strides. As you heard from our opening from Dr. Walker Pickett, really in just a matter of a few years, a good bit of work has been done. The most evident work to date is in the area of resources for members and circles, or at least in my opinion, I think it is. Most of the resources we're introducing here are publicly available on the ODK website. They're housed in a set of sub pages that I'll refer to comprehensively as the diversity resources website. The specific hyperlinks for each sub page is included here within our slides. The glossary includes the terms we defined together today, as well as many other terms, many of which you may be familiar with, but some that may be new to you and or to other fellow members. The next section of the diversity to, uh, resources website is, our, is organizations. The organizations list was sourced from society members, and it includes organizations such as the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union, the Equal Justice Initiative, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and the Center for Truth in Racial Healing and Transformation, among others, of course. The publications list was also sourced from society members and includes a wide array of publications from poetry to novels to nonfiction and evidence-based informational pieces. There are plenty of examples on the website and this list is ever growing. We encourage you, if you know of publications that are not yet listed on our website, to please submit um, that information to the national headquarters. And in particular, I think Dr. Walker Pickett would love to receive that information at ndo at odk.org. And we'll look at adding e extra publications to our list. Patsy, before you go on, we do have a question. Will these slides be made available for attendees in some form, or uh, should we take the screenshotting route to get the information? <laughs> Don't worry about screenshotting. We'll make them available. Okay, great. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Dr. Walker Pickett opened uh, our presentation with a number of exciting announcements and indeed another piece of the resources and opportunities that are made available to our collegiate members now um, and, and our members in general um, are the awards that have been established. The Society has established two annual awards to recognize achievement related to matters of diversity, equity, and inclusivity. The Anderson M. Robinson Champion Award is intended to celebrate an individual, a circle, an institution, or a program. 
The Community Commitment Award is specifically uh, focused on members whose ongoing personal commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusivity has positively impacted their communities. Yes, thank you, Zoom, for reminding me to not unmute myself. There are also other opportunities. The society itself approximately awards 40 scholarships each year. And of these awards, Omicron Delta Kappa has explicitly designated four total scholarships to individuals who identify with underrepresented populations. This is not only an effort toward equitable opportunity, but it's an also an effort for you at the circle level to draw in these individuals to make our circles more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. So on the diversity's website, you will find programming suggestions for circles. Now, some of these examples of what you can do at the circle level and see what I'm doing here is I'm tying the national strategic level with the tactical operational level where you live on your university campuses. So with this knowledge and these resources, you could do such things as partner with cultural organizations such as Black Student Unions, Hispanic Latinx Unions, Pride, Pride LBG, LGBTQIA organizations, or the Panhellenic uh, Multicultural Greek Council to host programming regarding inclusive leadership. You can engage in some kind of community service or philanthropic activities with organizations that serve underrepresented and marginalized members of your broader communities. You can develop recruitment campaigns that seek to cultivate a diverse group of new initiates that represent leaders from diverse identities as well as other camp campus life that is celebrated by the society, such as scholarship, athletics, service, and communication in the arts. You could convene conversations and leave and lead and drive these conversations with student leaders with diverse viewpoints to collaborate on ways to improve the student experience for the entire student body. And you can also think about something that, as Dr. Covington pointed out earlier, you can look below the iceberg and perhaps provide closed captioning for virtual events or signing at in-person events. Now, before I go and continue, I'd like to go back and touch upon the developed recruitment campaigns that seek to cultivate a diverse group of new initiates. Now, we all know that one of our pillars and one of our uh, 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 words fail me, Betsy, our, 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 our standards that we have is that not only that you are a leader on campus, but you have to maintain a certain grade point average. And sometimes there are some, I was one, that struggled a little bit with certain classes in college that maybe at some particular form, uh, time in your life as you start out, you're not doing so well. And maybe you're from an underrepresented class. I say this because I have a, a fraternity brother who is a mixed race male, who is a vice president of a company and has a doctorate in uh, nuclear engineering. Uh, now, back when I was in college with him, uh, nuclear engineering and him didn't do so well together. Well, looking back on it, he was a leader and he is currently a leader of a multinational corporation. And those are the type of things when you talk about develop recruitment campaigns, seek out those leaders who may not be uh, as well off academically, but there are somebody that you can teach, coach, and mentor up. And not only are you giving back the community, but you're doing an active act of trying to increase our ranks and you're serving that individual, some uh, servant leadership. Uh, just a suggestion, an idea that I thought of uh, today. So the Clay Grants provide financial support for leadership and circle programming, uh, leadership education and development. So this year we have two Clay Grants that we are gonna specifically designate to support circle initiatives which advance diversity, equity, and inclusivity on their campus. So as Dr. Coveting mentioned earlier, there are other organizations uh, on your campus that are striving to do these exact things. And so uh, the first rule of government spending, why buy one when you can have two for twice the price? So merge, look for these opportunities where you can re uh, uh, commit resources together to strengthen these programs and to make those alliances, and that is your recruitment pool to in order to bring more uh, uh, qualified members into our circles. So next slide. So what we would like you to do is we'd like you to identify and commit to specific organizations or actions, I apologize, that you can take in your circles and organizations to further diversity, equity, 
education and promotion of inclusive practices. Now, I wanna make sure that I emphasize the word commit because it's one thing to say, great, this was a great presentation. I learned a lot, but next up is action. So I will hand it over to Dr. Covington. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, even within the same person, there can still be a struggle. So I always encourage people to look inside themselves and here's an activity that circles can engage in. If I was sure that I could speak with complete honesty and what I had to say would be deeply welcomed, valued, and cherished within this group, I would say, a place in my life where I claim complete pride about my identity is, and they can share one of the social identities that's relevant to them. A place in my life where I sometimes struggle with my identity is. The reason that we have people engage in this activity is because once again, diversity, even within the same person can be extremely complex. And as we think about intersectionality, I always do this, which is the overlap of someone's social identity. There can definitely be more than meets the eye. This is not only relevant to um, whatever internal messages a person may be telling themselves, but also their worldview and how people perceive them in the community at large. Betsy, back to you. Thank you. Yet again, a visual from the person who enjoys visual learning. Um, this is the goal. This is the goal for moving our communities from diversity through equality to inclusion. Many of us may agree that our campuses reflect diverse spaces. Some of our campuses may be actively celebrating, supporting, and seeking to enhance the diversity of the community. Are our ODK circles doing the same? What about equality and inclusion? Are we actively working toward equality or equity as leaders on our campuses and in our communities? Are we taking action toward inclusive spaces within our circles and our campus and community? All three of these concepts require commitment and a level of intentionality or intervention. Our goal for you today at this time is to reflect on what intervention you can commit to that will reflect our society's commitment and lead efforts to impact matters of diversity, equi e equality or equity, and inclusion within your spheres of influence and beyond. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna break out into some uh, breakout rooms and brainstorm. And what I'd like you to do is, as uh, Betsy talked about, as Dr. Covington and Dr. Walker Pickett have talked about is we want you to have an intentional discussion. Be deliberate. On the screen, there are just five examples of a small sampling of ideas that you could enact on your campuses with, and within your circles. Consider how you could pick a particular commitment. How did you identify that need? Why is the issue that you picked or the action you picked important? Think about accountability connections. It's one thing to commit to an action, but how are we going to generate accountability of action to a completion and through the cycle of continuous learning and improvement, as I discussed earlier, to then feed back to the cycle and train the next generation of ODK leaders that come behind you. So with that, Jess, if you would make five, or uh, I don't know how many people we have, so probably about five per group if we've got about 15. We can do that. And I do want to make one uh, one point here before we go into our rooms. We do have a, a comment in the chat from Cassandra that I really want to bring to the surface before we head into our breakout rooms. So Cassandra says, as DNI director of the Arizona State University Circle, the president and I attended safe zone training at ASU this past week. I, as a veteran, also connected and participate in the Pat Tillman Veteran Center at ASU and have reached out to other groups. So I, I wanted to bring this to the attention of our, our presenters. I, I think this is a, just a phenomenal effort, you know, on your, on your campus, Cassandra, and for you individually, and that is definitely to be celebrated. And I hope that that leads others to to bring light to the things they're proud of and the efforts they're making on their campuses as well. So we will get into those breakout rooms now. Okay, it looks like we have everyone returning from their breakout rooms. I hope we had some good discussion. I will hand it back over to our presenters now. Okay, welcome back. 
Um, we'd love to hear from you. What did you learn from your peers? What have you decided to commit to? If anyone's comfortable unmuting and speaking up, we'd love to hear um, your conversations in your group. It's probably not wise to give me a microphone. <laughs> I've told people that before. <laughs> but anyway, so, so we actually jumped into a session. There are only two of us. And um, um, so we had difficulty at first remembering which one of these five that we were supposed to be <laughs> uh, looking into. I said three, but I wasn't entirely sure if it was initiatives or what. <laughs> So, but anyway, we talked about it and I mentioned the same thing that I put in the little chat box about uh, safe zone stuff, getting out and doing all that, uh, just being proactive about it on campus, wherever you are. Um, so, so we, um, we talked about that and my co subgroup member is from Florida. Yay, Florida. So that's awesome. And, um, and so she, so she and I uh, discussed different things about what we can do on campus. And we got to know each other a little bit better. That was good. Thank you, Cassandra. You definitely left us with a great example um, that you left in the chat and good inspiration for our conversations about what we can do on our circles. Anyone else? Ariel. I can't tell. You look like I, you might be thinking about it. Would you like to share? I, I can. I work in a library, so I have to whisper. But, but um, so we talked about um, bringing in more athletes and how they could be useful to build upon leadership. And we also talked about, um, this was really cool. Um, whoever was in my breakout room, I did not catch your name. So if you could drop in the chat, that'd be awesome because I definitely want to get your information. Um, but we also talked about um, bringing in more transfer students and non-traditional students like mothers and veterans, um, which we got that great idea from Cassandra. And so um, whether that means doing two membership cycles in the fall and spring to catch those transfer students who come in the spring or either those who come in the fall. Um, and then we also talked about doing, um, we, we personally offer membership stipends for individuals with socioeconomic issues. Um, and we also talked about reaching out with LGBTQ plus groups, um, BSU, which is our Black Student Union Coalition, Latinx and NPHT to bring in those people and the McNair Institute. Um, and then we also talked about reaching out to housing um, to help catch those sophomores since we can now take in sophomores. And lastly, I mentioned that our circle does a freshman leader of the year award. So we highlight seven to 10 freshmen a year so that hopefully their sophomore year, since they've been recognized, they'd be encouraged to apply um, and possibly hold some sort of leader position and um, also we have a lot of satellite campuses at the University of Mississippi so we've started doing satellite circles for our like Grenada campuses and DeSoto campuses in Mississippi um, and so they either they can attend our meetings virtually or they'll have their own meetings. Awesome thank you Ariel and thank you for <laughs> whispering to us but but sharing such useful information thank you. So so great so we've heard about some recruitment campaigns and lots of different ideas it sounds like you were brainstorming around recruiting um, diverse individuals um, and then we've heard about supporting um, and so supporting our membership and perhaps advancing uh, matters within our campus community so well done. Um, we will go ahead and uh, move for the sake of time into into a brief closing and an opportunity for uh, questions. And so uh, before we go or before we go into questions, I want to make a point to thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, on behalf of today's co-presenters and the entire ODK Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity, I thank you for your interest in today's topic and the good work that you've done and that you will do. You are the boots on the ground of our committee and our society as a whole. Your actions to further conversation, commitment, and action and to enhance the diversity, equity, and inclusivity of our society are the impetus for growth and change. So kudos to you and best wishes. At this point, we'll take questions. And if anyone wants to write their questions in the chat, I, we have a little SEC rivalry going on in the chat right now, but um, if anyone has wants to write down their ideas and questions in the chat for us to save for later, uh, we do have one question. Presenters, if one of you could just address the difference between equity and equality, that's been used interchangeably sometimes in some some circles, some organizations. So if you could talk about the difference between these two terms and just as an education piece for us, that would be really helpful. 
Uh, this is Dr. Covington, one billion percent. Um, Betsy, can I please have permission to share my screen? So the difference between equity and equality is that um, when it comes to, first of all, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. I'm gonna have to flip it, give me one second. All right, so the difference is that, first of all, most people see life through the lens of their experience. Equality is implying that you give everyone the same thing, but equity is actually taking, being intentional about meeting people where they're at. So I'm gonna be very quickly, cause I know that we're pressed for time. So let's say for example, if everyone is coming into the institution starting at the bottom of the ladder, looking to get to the top of the ladder to get their degree or their certificate at said institution. Equality imagines the world is equal, but we understand that the world is not equal. We have some students who are coming in with scholarships, educated parents, SAT and ACT tutors, middle to upper middle class, honor courses, AP, active social networks. At the same time, we have other students who are coming from poorly funded schools, less skilled teachers, counselor ratios one to a thousand, and a truncated curriculum. Now, if we only add, in addition to that rather, we also understand that the individuals who are coming from more privileged backgrounds are coming from also predominantly white backgrounds, whereas those who are coming from that um, lesser backgrounds are coming from, they're dealing with microaggression, implicit bias, which I spoke about, predominantly marginalized group, and disproportionate remediation. If we only add diversity to that group, that's not addressing the issue. In order to meet these individuals where they're at, Equity looks at the regular disaggregation of data and analysis, goal setting and planning in order to meet those students where they're at, faculty and staff training to be equitable facilitators, and inquiry to understand how practices impede, impede equity. One of the things that we spoke about during this presentation uh, by default of some of the things that were shared was the whole concept of um, safe zone training. For those of you who are not familiar with safe zone training, safe zone training's goal is to teach others how to create more inclusive spaces for individuals who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, in regards to equity, part of equity, one of the things that we have here at Finger Lakes Community College, we have what's called an institutionally recognized name policy, where we um, address students by their name and pronoun, because we want to make sure that we're creating spaces that reflects the student's lived experience and their social identity. So very quickly, equality is giving everyone the same thing. Equity is better, which should be your goal in meeting people where they're at. Thank you so much, Dr. Covington. We are out of time for this session. Thank you all for being here and joining in this conversation. I hope you will continue the conversations with our presenters throughout the rest of the conference using Event Moby, and we hope to see you in later sessions. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.